Well, good evening. It's, it's great to have you um, joining with us in our Bible study for joining online. Um, if you're in the room, I apologize for my presence being um, absent from you. Um, the reason I'm, I'm not um, in this room with you, but we've actually pre-recorded this, is Gillian was sent for a, a PCR test last night, and the result hasn't come back in yet. Um, so, uh, just as a precaution, I'm, I'm not in your midst. I'm breathing the same air as you. Um, hopefully, um, her PCR test will come back negative. She just happens to have the cold at the same time, which I'm pretty sure is just the cold, hopefully. Um, but we'll um, keep you informed if, if there's any developments on that front. But that's why I'm not with you, and that's why James has kindly agreed to record this earlier in the day, and you've got to sit there and, and watch when you could have been sitting at home. So apologies for that, but I hope you still have a great time in the Room of Fellowship together. Um, some of the notices to, to share with you this coming Saturday evening... At seven o'clock in the building here, we're putting together the shoe boxes for Blyswood. If you want to come along and help with that, it's going to be a great night, we trust. And there's also going to be a talk from someone um, from Blyswood to just inspire us a little bit in how these shoe boxes are going to help and how they're being used in different places. On Sunday, we've got the two services, one at nine, one at 11. If you could email the church office ahead of time to let us know you're coming, that just gives us a bit of um, fore planning and preparation to make the, the services run, at least getting people in and out that little bit smoother. So that's at 9 and 11 on Sunday. And then next Wednesday, we're not having a Bible study, but on the Thursday, which is the 5th of November, from 9.30 to, from 7.30 to 9.30, we've got an ACORN evangelism course that's taking place in here. And I encourage you all, or as many of you as possible, um, to come along and, and see um, this method, which, like I mentioned on Sunday, it's, it's an easy way to incorporate obedience to Christ in the Great Commission into your life. And with some of the, the fail-safes built around it, um, it, it just seems really, really uh, good. So that's a week tomorrow, 5th of November from 7.30 to 9.30. And that's all the notices either way. So we're going to begin our worship by singing together Speak, O oh Lord. And if you're in the room, you can stand to sing this.
Let's uh, turn to God's Word together. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, back in the Sermon on the Mount. Last time together we looked at Jesus' teaching on divorce in the Sermon on the Mount, and this evening we're looking at His teaching on um, oaths, vows, how we use our mouths, our words. Uh, so we're in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33 down to the end of the verse, Mark 37, and this is what the Word of God says. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let me just pray for us. I know we've sung together that God would speak and that hymn is a prayer, but let me pray for us as we approach these verses that we would hear and respond to the word of our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that we have it personally, that it's been gifted to us from You. Father, that Your Word teaches us what we're to believe concerning You and what duty You require from us. And Father, as we get to spend some time together now around these words of our Redeemer and our King, help us to hear, help us to understand, to process But help us not just believe them in our minds. Help us to believe them in such a fashion we do what He calls us to do, that we become the people that He has called us to be in the midst of this, our generation. May we, the church, indeed be a people who rise up and resemble our Redeemer and our King. So to that end, please give to us your Spirit now. May He remind us of the reality of the gospel, that by Christ we are your redeemed children, that on account of Christ and His blood that has been shed, we have been gifted the blessed Spirit, and that by His enabling and by His empowering, we can walk in the path that is set before us as followers of Christ. So hear our prayer. Continue with us. Help us to hear. Help us to do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So again, we're, we're back in the Sermon on the Mount. And what we've been thinking about over these past um, three times together, at least in the Sermon on the Mount, is, is unpacking that, that verse 20 where he says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as a, as a church here, we have a uh, a statement, a vision statement, if that's a correct term for it, which is this. This is what our church is is all about. It's supposed to be what everything is geared toward when it says this. We exist to excel in following after Jesus and to help others do the same. To exist, we exist to excel in following after Jesus and to help others do the same. Now, if that's true, and we're actually serious about that, then that means that when it comes to reading the Bible in particular, the Gospels, very, very specifically the Gospels, are where we are going to go to learn what it is to follow after Jesus. It's not reducing the worth of other portions of Scripture. It's just making it clear that in the Gospels, Jesus is clearly portrayed before our eyes. And on top of that, even within the Gospels, when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount in particular, this should be like our staple diet. This, this should be like our bread and butter for us. Because in here, what Jesus is doing is He's describing what a disciple is, describing what a follower of Jesus actually is. And then in the remainder of this sermon, He's talking about how we follow after Him. He's making it absolutely clear this is what He expects from His followers. So often in 21st century thinking, we get this idea that a Christian is somebody who believes certain things about God, 
about Jesus, uh, about the Bible, about the world, about eternity, about sin, about the cross. So, so Christians believe certain things, and that is true. But Jesus unashamedly it becomes so clear in verse 20. He has this idea that Christians, followers of Him, are going to have an, an outward display of righteousness that they will be known by. So, what He's doing in the, the remainder of chapter 5 after that statement in verse 20 is He's unpacking what that means. And we've seen what it means in regard to, to anger, how much further His calling goes than the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. We've seen what it means in regard to the command, you shall not commit adultery, in what the scribes and the Pharisees were saying what that meant, and how much further Jesus unpacks the law, giving us the true meaning of it. And then last time we were together, we thought about what the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching concerning divorce and the divorce under any cause type clause, and yet Jesus comes in and narrows that um, teaching with the clear teaching of Scripture that you cannot have an any cause divorce. And then this evening, we hear that refrain again. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. And we heard this back in verse 21, and then came three of the examples. Now we hear it again. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old. And what follows is another three examples of how Jesus is, is filling out the law and applying it for us and explaining how our lives are supposed to be lived as followers of Jesus. So, this is what the scribes and the Pharisees were saying. So, this is verse 33. You shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now, again, this is not Jesus quoting the law. This is Jesus explaining, this is what you've been taught by the scribes and the Pharisees, and explaining to them that this is what you've heard, and then Jesus is going to answer this in just a moment with, but I say to you. But first of all, we've got to understand what they were told. Now, initially, again, this seems absolutely fine and noble, moral even. At face value, all they're being told is, you don't swear falsely, but rather you perform to the Lord everything that you have sworn. And we would all agree that when somebody gives their word, and I'm sure we'd agree in this, that when somebody gives their word on something, they should do that. They should honor their word. They should be honorable people in that sense. And if they said they're going to do something, they should do it. If they've sworn to do something, they should fulfill that, and therefore they should not swear falsely. I'm sure we, we've all known that feeling that arises within our heart when somebody gives their word about something, and then they don't follow through on it. The, the different feelings that rise up within us, like injustice or even just plain anger, because they said they would do this, and they just didn't do it. How much worse when that happens, and there is absolutely no remorse whatsoever. So, in our house, I'll give you an exa a personal example, but in our house, I'm kind of known as somebody who particularly doesn't like the Welsh. Now, that's not technically true. There was one Welsh fella who, it's the first time I'd ever been into Wales, I think, but I saw this people carrier, we, we needed a car at the time, looking for people carriers, and there was one in Wales, it was five hours from our house in Suffolk to get to Wales, and then five hours back. And I spoke to this guy online. He, he described the particular car in question. It was being sold from a garage. So you think, okay, well, that, that sounds like it will be fine. So I drove five, my, five hours to get to, to Wales, took this people carrier for a, a test drive. It seemed perfect. Um, so then I drove back with said people carrier five hours to Suffolk. And everything seemed absolutely fine. It had years MIT and all that sort of stuff on it with um, none of the, the bits on it that give you little warnings. It all seemed absolutely fine. And it was coming from a garage. It's got to be fine. And the guy kept saying, this is a really good car. So I, I took him at his word, took the car home. A couple of days later, though, the, something just didn't feel right driving this particular car. So I took it to my mate, who is a mechanic, and just left it with him, and he phoned me, got me back down to the garage, and he said, this thing is an absolute death trap. Please tell me you never had your kids in it. And I thought, well, yeah, I had all of them in it, and, and Julian as well. He said, the thing is an absolute 
death trap. It's amazing that this thing got through an MOT because he would fail it on pretty much everything underneath. It looked fine to look at, but underneath it was just a wreck, the brakes, everything, just terrible. So I phoned the guy that I bought it from. He denied ever selling me the car to start with, which was an interesting one. Um, and then closing off that conversation, I said, can you just tell me one thing? How do you sleep at night? And his response was, I sleep absolutely fine. Even better knowing that your money is in my bank account. And with that, he hung up. Now, at that point, I didn't particularly like the Welsh, which is a bit harsh. It was just that particular gentleman I had an issue with. But we all know what it feels like when somebody says they're going to do something and they don't fulfill their word, or they swear to something, and then it doesn't happen. And what the, the scribes and the Pharisees were doing here, were they, they were saying, no, don't, don't do that. Don't be that person. And initially, you think, well, that sounds um, fine. But what was happening in their day was that people would swear on certain things. And, and whenever you swear on something, now when you think about it, and you've got to give it a little bit of thought, if you swear by something, you're appealing to something outside of you that you regard as greater than you. So you might appeal to God, you might appeal to the throne of God, you might appeal to the heavens, you may appeal to the earth, you may appeal uh, to your parents' grave. So I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear on my father's grave, um, or you might swear upon your children's lives or your parents' lives. You're appealing to something outside of you that kind of buttresses what you're saying, bolsters the statement you're about to make. So you might say, I swear on my children's lives, I will be there. So you're appealing to something you value highly, which would be your children. And because you're swearing on their lives, the person listening to you is kind of encouraged to think, this one is really, really serious. So what he's saying must be true. So the tradition that they were being taught by the scribes and the Pharisees is, don't swear falsely. So if you swear on something you make absolutely certain you fulfill that promise or that vow. That's what they were to aim for. Now, Jesus says, that's what you've heard. Jesus comes in and says this. Verse, I'm going to read verse 34 down to verse 36. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is His footstool or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Jesus is coming in like this. He says, no, here's what I would say to you. Swear by nothing. Take no oath at all. And he covers the entire spectrum. That The greatest of things, heaven itself, don't swear by that. Even earth, which may seem so far removed from heaven, don't swear by that. That's the very footstool of God. And don't swear by the holy city, Jerusalem, because that is the city of the great king. And don't even think about swearing by yourself. You know, we, we might often say, I cross my heart and hope to die. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus is saying, don't do that. Because in all of these things, you have control over none of them. We have no control over the heavens. We have no control over the earth. We have no control over Jerusalem or the temple in Jerusalem. In actual fact, we don't even have control over the hairs in our own heads. That the longer that I let my hair grow, the more I realize that many of the hairs that used to be black, they are now a different shade. Of, well, they're not really. They're just now white or gray. And no matter how long I stand in front of the mirror speaking to them, I cannot change the color of them from gray, black, back to black. I cannot do that with mere speech. So if I can't change the color of one hair on my head, then why would I swear by it? If my voice can't even change the color of a hair on my head, why would I swear by my head? Instead, what Jesus is saying is, you don't swear by anything at all. Simply, he says, verse 37, let what you say be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. But there is this thing, you, you know, when you, if you were to listen to two people making a statement, one of them says this, 
I swear on my family's life, I am telling the truth. So that's one statement. And you've got this swearing on his family's life that he is telling the truth. And that seems to add some weight to his statement. Or you simply have somebody saying, I am telling the truth. This one seems more weighty. If you've got two people, I mean, I mean this one is swearing upon his, his family's life, and this other one here is simply saying, I am telling the truth. You see this one here who simply makes a statement of fact or truth. All he's leaving you with is naked truth. And what you're called attention to, therefore, are not just the words that come out of his mouth, but all you've got to back that, that up is his integrity. That's it. There's nothing being appealed to outside of himself. All you're left with is his integrity, the integrity of the one speaking. And that's the point that Jesus is making here for us in these verses. And this is where when you start paying attention to what was actually going on in the first century, it is fascinating is probably a strong word, but it kind of is. They had this entire volume to teach them how to deal with vows and oaths. It's part of the Mishnah that was a tradition of the scribes and the Pharisees, and it taught people about vows and oaths and how certain vows and oaths had to be kept, and other vows and oaths, you didn't have to keep them. So if you were to swear by the temple, you didn't have to keep that one. However, if you swore by the gold in the temple, that was a vow and an oath you had to keep. When it came to the altar, you, if you swore by the altar, you didn't actually have to keep that one. But if you swore by the things that were on the altar, you definitely had to keep that one. So there's a whole volume, an entire book with all these loopholes which says, okay, if you've made this vow or you've sworn by this, um, this one you keep, this one, here's how you get out of it. So, so the whole no notion of um, vows and oaths has become this hotly contentious deba debated topic. And there were certain things that people were saying, you swear by this, you vow by this, you can swear by this, but not by these ones. And Jesus comes in and says, look, let me help you out. You swear by nothing. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. In Jesus' day, or just after Jesus' day, there's this particular group of zealous Jews, a sect we might say, called the Essenes. And a, a Jewish historian wrote about them saying this, they are eminent for fidelity and are the ministers of peace. Whatsoever they, they say also is firmer than an oath, but swearing an oath is avoided by them. And they esteem it, swearing an oath, worse than perjury. For they say that he who cannot be believed without swearing by something, or God, as in swearing by God, that person is already condemned. See, the Essenes actually believed that if somebody had to swear by something, there was a lack of integrity about them. What they were making absolutely clear by their oath is that the naked truth had no position with them, no place with them. As one person once said, oaths arise since men are so often liars. That's why Jesus adds this, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So when you, you think about all these things that are going on, what Jesus is actually calling forth from, from us as followers of Him is integrity, truthfulness. It's as if He expects His followers to speak truth just as He did. Now, that might sound really simple, and it is, but the reality is in the world in which we live, called to be followers of Jesus, maintaining our integrity, our truthfulness, 
can oftentimes be hard. And we live in a world which urges us to sell our integrity for something else. I mean, how often have you read the story of Jacob and Esau where, where you know, Esau comes in from the, the field or whatever it is he's doing, and, and Jacob's in there, and he's got this, this you know, this, this plate full of really nice food, uh, and Esau comes in, he says, like, give it to me. I want some of that food. And, and like proper brothers, like, like they were, he's like, no, you're not having my food, and they, they start arguing about it. And then Jacob kind of, maybe half-heartedly, maybe not knowing Jacob, said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you this plate of food, you give me your inheritance. And he's just like, okay, sold, done. And you read that um, moment there and you think, seriously? I mean, the guy's an idiot. Who, who gives up his inheritance for a, a pot of food? And yet he did. And yet how often do, are we faced with exactly the same thing in our lives? selling our integrity for something. Let me give you um, two examples of what I'm, I'm speaking about. I may have used them both before. It, it doesn't matter. It kind of emphasizes the point. So about a um, few months after we arrived up here in Inverness, drove over from the other side of Inverness to drop the kids off at the academy here and was driving back and got pulled over by the police. Now, I assumed it was either one of the, the police personnel, policemen, what are we supposed to call them these days, um, from football on a Monday night having a laugh, or one of the police personnel in the church pulling me over to have a laugh. So I, I kind of ran around the back of the van waiting to see exactly who it was, and it was a police person I'd never, ever seen before. Uh, and whilst I was smiling, she definitely was not smiling. And her comment to me, or her, her lead in to this was, you know why I've pulled you over. At which point I kind of shook my head and said, no, you've, you've got me in this one. I have no idea why you pulled me over. She said, you know why I've pulled you over. Then I started thinking, well, is, is there tax on it? Which I think there is, and it's insured, and there's an MOT, so it, it can't be that. So I, I looked around at the people carrier we had at that point and thought, there's nothing obvious hanging off, or there's no kids on the roof or anything like that. So I, I really was kind of at a loss as to why this policewoman had pulled me over. And she said, again, you know why I've pulled you over. And I said, look, not trying to be funny, I have no idea why you've pulled me over. So if you could enlighten me, that would speed this whole process up. At which point she said, you were on your phone and I saw you. So I'd come around the roundabout and they were ready to come on to the roundabout. And apparently she saw me on my phone. And I said to her, look, I don't know what you saw, but I was definitely not on my phone. She said, you were, I saw you. And then this went back and forth a little bit, and then I asked her this question, which afterwards seemed a little bit stupid, but it was an honest question of my, my heart. I asked, I asked her, why would I lie to you? Now, her response to that was, well, the reason that you would lie to me is to avoid three points and a 50-pound fine, which it was back then. I know the fine is a lot more now, but she said, you would obviously lie to avoid three points on your license and a 50-pound fine. Now, when you think about it, how many people actually would? So they would lie to get out of three points and 50 pounds. We'd laugh at Esau who would sell his birthright, his inheritance, for a plate of food. What about people who would sell their integrity just to avoid three points and a 50 pound fine? It'd be tempting for so many people, wouldn't it? In case you're wondering, no, I was not on my phone. Well, let me give you another example. This is one that I heard years ago, and it has just stuck with me, reminding me of the importance of integrity, that we say yes or no, and we don't lie for, for any reason or for any price. So this um, businesswoman who went very, very far in her chosen field, and she was always destined for greatness. She just had that about her. And everybody knew she was going to go far and she was going to get there fast. And she employed a PA. And her PA was only a few days into the job with her, um, learning exactly what he was supposed to be doing. And he, somebody phoned up wanting to speak to his boss. So he um, put them on hold, phoned through to her and said, look, such and such is on the phone wanting to speak to you. And her reply to him was, just tell them I'm not in. Now, what do you do 
Well, what do you do if it could cost you your job? He's being asked to lie on her behalf. What do you do? His response was this. You tell them yourself, I'll transfer them through. And then he hit the button, transferred the call through, and then he waited anxiously, thinking, how angry is she going to be? Well, am I still going to have a job after she's finished this phone call? And after the phone call, he was summoned into her office, and she let him have it all barrels, both barrels, and she tore shreds out of him. And when she'd finished, she said, now, do you have anything to say for yourself? And this is what he said. He said, look, let me assure you of something. I will never lie for you. But what that also means is I will never lie to you. Don't expect me to tell lies on your behalf, but you can be assured I will never tell a lie toward you. The result was she went on and went to the top in her career. And the one employee that went with her all the way through her career advancement was her PA. Because the one thing that she, he had that she knew that he had was integrity. And she valued that more than anything else. And what Jesus is saying here in this text is what he's looking for in his followers is integrity. Let their yes be yes and their no be no, that they speak truth like he spoke truth. You go into James chapter 5, and you find James saying exactly the same thing where he says this. Above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. You find the same thing in the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, look, this is what I want you to do. Speak truth in love. So, what Jesus is saying here is what He wants coming forth from our mouths is truth. If we can say yes, then say yes. If we mean no, say no. Does it mean that you can never, ever, under any circumstances whatsoever, swear an oath or take a vow? Of course, He doesn't mean that. Because the thing that he was just speaking about before this is marriage. And in marriage, it involved in his day, as in ours, the exchanging of vows. Does this mean that when you're, if you ever end up in a courtroom and they, they ask you to put your hand on the Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, that you're not allowed to do that as the Quakers would believe? It doesn't mean that. There are certain areas in Scripture where vows are allowed. There's even a place in Scripture where God, because He can't swear by anything greater than Himself, He swears by Himself. We've thought about that in the book of Hebrews. So, there's unique moments in life and in culture where we are called upon to swear a vow. But in the usual run of life, Jesus is saying you swear on nothing. You take an oath on nothing. What you allow to back up your words is the integrity of your lives. So, what Jesus is expecting is men and women who are following after Him, who are known for their integrity, and therefore their word is their bond. And that's what He's expecting from us as followers of Him. We will excel in following after Him as our integrity matches, is like unto His. Let me pray for us in that regard. Heavenly Father, You tell us in Your Word, Your Son taught us that it's out of the overflow of our hearts that our mouths speak. Father, may our hearts, as we focus in upon Christ, who is full of grace and truth, may our hearts be so filled with truth that out of the overflow of truth, our mouths speak. May we be those who simply allow naked truth to be backed up by the integrity of our lives. Father, keep us from swearing upon things that we have no control over at all. And may we be known then to be like unto Christ. In His name we ask. Amen. We're going to um, finish off our time by singing together um, a song called Grace. And we'll stand, if you're in the room, you can stand and sing, and we'll close out our time in that fashion. Thank you.
Praise rise up 